And good evening, everybody, and welcome once more to Cosmic Tuesdays. Today is October 2nd, 2017. It's been quite a weekend um, between all the activity going on and, and rock star deaths and everything else. Uh, energy is high and hopping. Um, my name is Anthony Pico. I am your guest uh, your guest interviewer tonight. I am the host. I am here every week as I always am. Sorry I'm a little dis- discombobulated today. Uh, but uh, tonight I have a guest named Mark Pulse, who's a fascinating guy on a spiritual journey. But first, a couple of things to talk about. Um, one, the whole goal behind this show I want to talk about briefly, which is there are two goals to the show. Okay, Number one, uh, I interview all types of people, um, all sorts of disciplines, all kinds of skills, all levels of awareness, uh, all kinds of knowledge. So, like, listen, and uh, if you like something a guest says, then please take it, use it, make it yours, and if you don't like some of what they say, then then ignore it or examine it or, or whatever you need to do. To me, the goal for all of us at this point in the universe's existence, whatever you want to call it, is to create our own personal spirituality. Because yes, we are all one with the universe, but we are also, each one of us, very distinct people, and we all come in to this world with our own viewpoint and our own goals to add uh, our energies to this uh, wonderful stew we're creating. Okay, One size no longer fits all. Be yourself and be connected at the same time. Uh, the second reason I do the show is just to remind myself and everybody else, we are not alone in these beliefs. Uh, many people are interested in these things that up until now have not been considered mainstream. But, uh, you know, times are changing and uh, people are adapting and growing. And I know in the past 30 years there's been a tremendous surge of people interested in the so-called paranormal, whether it's astrology or psychic abilities or Reiki or whatever it might be. So we have people uh, growing and uh and expanding, and so we'll see what happens next. So hopefully we can focus and remember uh, the world is not is not permanently broken. Uh, I think we're going through growing pains and changes right now. I think the world needs to evolve. I think uh, there's a lot of trouble as we try to shift from uh, one way of being to another. And I'm hoping and praying that more people become more evolved and uh, connected as opposed to feeling disconnected and feeling the need to do some sort of violent uh, attention-getting of some kind for whatever uh, whatever reason they might have. Um, so, tonight, Mark Pulse is... Uh, He's a regular guy. He's not a regular guy, but he is a regular guy. Uh, the same way all of us are regular people and, and unique in our own ways. Um, I'm interviewing Mark tonight. He'll be back in a few weeks for a second show, and we'll get to that later. But part of what I was fascinated with is I got to know Mark, and he's he's somewhere on his spiritual path and his journey like all of us are. Uh, none of us are quite finished. You know, a spiritual journey keeps us going. I know that... Uh, Every time I think, oh, I'm evolved, I'm okay now, something came along and I suddenly had to evolve some more because that's just the nature of life. You don't always have everything figured out. I know as an astrologer, uh, stuff I knew, I knew a lot of stuff when I started being an astrologer, but I found that uh, I have continued to learn, even almost every reading I do for people uh, teaches me a little more about astrology, and I think I'm far more knowledgeable and sophisticated and evolved than I was when I started 31 years ago. Um, and that's really what life paths are about and spiritual paths are about. And so I thought it would be interesting to just pick uh, pick somebody and go through what's going on in their lives, where they are right now, what they're learning, and the things that matter to them. Uh, Mark, Mark, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I am. How are you doing, Tony? Ah, welcome aboard, Mark. Um, Thanks. Uh, this, this is going to be interesting because I think, you know, some of what you're going through is pretty fascinating, but let's let's go back to square one. Uh, you're born, you come into a family that. Uh, what's the spiritual background? Are is it a Christian family? Is it a we don't know what anything is family? Is it what's kind of background? Are they all Wiccans? I don't know what kind of a background <laughs> coming out of. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking. Uh, first, I do just want to send uh, my hearts and thoughts and prayers out to everyone in Las Vegas. I was actually there on Saturday. I left Saturday, so I have some friends friends there, but uh, you know, everything will turn for the better, but uh, it's an unfortunate situation. Yes. Um, so um, I am born to two German people. They uh, both emigrated to the United States, met here, and we were raised Lutheran. So we had a Lutheran church uh, at the end of our street that we always went to on Sundays. 
That's, that's where I started. I, I started that way too. So okay, we're both in square one as Lutherans. Uh, <laughs> and uh, did you? I don't mean to be disrespectful by by putting it this way, but did you buy it when you went to the church? Did you think there was like, well, what's going on here? This seems like a lot of BS to me. Were you trying yeah. to be Christian? What was your What was your response to what you grew up out of? Well, culturally, it was very important to do very family-oriented, very structured things. Being German is a very structured culture, so we had our place. So every, we just did it. I think it was very routine, and we did it. And I could sing, so I did a lot of singing in choruses. Uh, my aunt and uncle are in Western Pennsylvania, which is you know farmland, very you know grassroots type people, and we would always go to their church as well. But they're very highly religious, and I would always sing duets with my cousin. So we would uh, always figure out a song to sing. And I go to Sunday school, but it felt very routine to me more than it was something I really bought, per se. So you, it was just a social thing you did as opposed to a profoundly spiritual experience at any level, is what you kind yeah, of Yeah, it was, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's nine o'clock on a Sunday. Yeah. Time to go, right? Yeah. Time to go to church. That's, that's what you do. And it was just very regimented. Uh, well, there wasn't much feeling behind it. There's just more of a structure behind it. And uh, you grew up and just started wandering your way with like no real, and I use the term spiritual very loosely, uh, no spiritual connection mm-hmm. in the sense of like, is there a God? Is there not a God? What were you holding on to when you first left home? I do. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I remember this part. I remember they uh, there was this movie about the rapture. The rapture was a big thing that uh, you know in the Bible about two thirds of the people staying on Earth and a third leaving, and then having this right. thing happen. I remember seeing this movie and coming home, home from church absolutely horrified. I mean, <laughs> I remember just being absolutely scared to death about that happening, right. and I was very emotional about it. But but I was never fear like I never feared God. I never had any kind of you know, do it for this. I just tried to always do the right thing in general. You know, it wasn't based on religion or spirit in any way. So it wasn't like I'm going to do something good because God will notice me and I'm cool. Uh, it was just... Exactly. <laughs> it's, oh, someone fell down. I want to help them up. It wasn't, oh, gosh, God's going to notice me picking someone up right. so that, you know, I'll go to heaven, I guess. You know. No, that whole rapture, end of the world stuff got to me when I... Because I was very young and I, I bought the Lutheran thing really kind of hook, line, and sinker because I was seeking some sort of spirituality. And uh, I would have dreams sure. as a kid that, like begging my parents to accept Jesus as their savior because the end of the world was coming and I didn't want them to go to hell. Uh, and I mean, right. I laugh at it now, but it's like, I'm thinking like, what a horrible thing for a kid to be going through, you know, uh, waking up. Yeah, way. it was pretty horrifying. You know, um, not that people can't find peace and, and enlightenment in uh, the context of Christianity, uh, but I think it, you've got to go a bit deeper than the daily, you know, um, stuff that people do. But so, so you're I agree. cruising along, um, it, you know, I know at some point early on you started going to a therapist, an NLP therapist. Um, well, that was that was later in life. Actually, it was only yeah, about two years ago. I know, but but um, what was going on yeah. between that time spiritually that like you didn't start? Were you digging before? Were you just sort of like enjoying day to day life and not really giving spirituality yeah. a, a deep thought? Well, that's the thing. My my father's highly religious. He um he actually has some old texts and he translates the Bible in a very unique way. And, you know, the moon doesn't mean the moon, and 5,000 years isn't 5,000 years, and all these types of, you know, the symbolic parts of the Bible. So he's always pushing that. Well, uh, in 1988, I was in a, involved in a pretty serious car accident, actually. Okay. And uh, I was bedridden for nine weeks. Yeah. And my, I just remember every day my father, someone telling me how angels saved me, and my question was always... How, how is this saving me? You know, I never understood the why of how, how that happened to me, right? Right. So that that really, that was 13 years old at that time, so it really traumatized me with that. And that actually made me turn away from any of that because I'm being told here that I was saved. And I certainly didn't feel saved. I felt like I was burdened or I was punished for something that I didn't understand. Yeah, you would have been would have been saved if you never had the accident is what you're saying. Exactly. I yeah, mean, you know, yeah. saving me from, you know, a lifetime of pain and, and, and uh, anguish. I mean, it was a really tough time in my life. I was very active. Um, I could have sung in, you know, the Philadelphia Boys Choir, but I chose sports. And 
the year that I chose sports, it was literally ripped from me. You know, it's so you, it's the why question, right? Like why, why? Um, and I've always been from science as well, so I always needed to explain things. You can tell me something, but if I don't understand the back the back, background, I, I don't go that direction. I have to have context. No, that's that's understandable. That's the way science works. Um, <laughs> you know, it isn't always the way spirituality works. But you, I remember you telling me, we had a conversation a few weeks ago, and you remember you telling me that um, something weird kind of happened connected to the accident that you've, quotes, never been able to explain, Which, but it, so it stayed with you. Would, would you mention that the person you saw beforehand? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, so... I uh, went to the went to a Phillies game, a baseball game in Philadelphia. They were playing the Cubs in 1988, and uh, two people of the four people that were originally going to go weren't able to make it. So the whole day, I didn't really feel right about going in the first place. I just didn't want to go. But I'm 13, and I play baseball. Okay. What 13 year old doesn't want to go to a baseball game, right? It's kind of odd that I felt that way. Now this is hindsight, right? Hindsight, kind of looking back. So we go to we go to my mom's work, and we're both we're all supposed to leave there. And like I said, two people canceled and I was supposed to ride with one person. I just didn't want to go, but I didn't have the heart to tell my mom. You know, she went out of her way to get tickets and did a really nice thing. So my mom told the guy driving to stop at at the uh, public uh, subway at SEPTA. And then we were going to take the train downtown. Okay. Well, we go we go past the train station. Goes, Oh, no, the train station's back there. He goes, that's okay. We'll just drive. For some reason, I can't explain it. I just knew I wasn't coming home that day. I, I don't know why. I just at 13, but I just knew okay. I was not going to set foot in my house that night. I, it just felt weird. So now Philadelphia's a big city, you know, a couple million people, a few million people, and we scalped the two tickets. And there's a whole row of scalpers. It's got to be 50 or 100 of them at the fence, you know, waiting outside. Right. And they scalp them off to other people, right? End of the first inning, second inning, this couple walks in and sits down in the seats that we scalped. So I kind of razzed them about what they paid for the ticket and how cheap we sold them, and nothing, nothing major at all. But um, on the way home, uh, I had a really serious car accident. I was ejected from a vehicle. Uh, I was sent to an emergency room, the closest emergency room, and then I was actually transferred after I was stable to a children's hospital uh, uh, later that night. Well, I wake up in the morning. Oh, god! Just, think so. so I'm wondering. So, so do you, what is the extent of your injuries? Like, what do you know? What was broken what wasn't what happened like can we get a little yeah oh absolutely so um i had my left leg up on the dashboard and i was kind of asleep it was late night it didn't have the the car was an old cargo van it didn't have a lap belt in it okay. so i actually kind of was ejected either out the side or the front window i think i was out the windshield uh the guy who was driving the car tried to outrun a tractor trailer merging oh boy <laughs> and uh there was a canine car behind another car changing a flat tire on the side on the shoulder uh, he hit those two vehicles, then Kareem skimmed the uh, tractor trailer and then hit some guardrails. At some point, I was actually ejected, uh, and I broke my femur, and I hit my head pretty good. Um, I did have a little bit of an out-of-body experience. I do recall being kind of in a heap, kind of floating over my body with uh, you know the red and white lights or the red and blue lights, right. uh, emergency lights. That's what I remember, but that was all later. I didn't, re- I didn't, didn't happen right away. Okay. My first conscious memory, though. Uh, so I broke my femur. I was taken to the emergency room. Then I was stabilized. Then taken to another trans- transfer to another hospital. Well, I, w- I wake up and my parents. No one's there except for one person sitting there. And it was the woman who actually bought the scalp ticket from the scalper that we sold it to at the at the baseball game. So I found that very odd. Um, yeah, I I didn't understand what was going on with that. Very unusual synchronicity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and she told me she said she was a doctor at the hospital. She was doing regular rounds, and she saw she recognized me, and she stayed there till I woke up, and I never saw her again. And now that I'm kind of looking into my spirituality and going on my journey, I'm looking back at that moment as kind of a very synchronous event that I should have paid more attention to. I think. Well, don't sh- as they say, don't shut on yourself. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. But no, there's some, look, there's plenty of moments in my life when I've just let it slip right by and later on go, oh, but, you know, you keep going forward. Uh, but obviously it's something that stayed with you. I mean, you, you you may not have grabbed it at the moment, but it stayed with you for some reason, you know, and it is unusual. It absolutely stayed with 
I mean, it is unusual yeah. to have a person you sold tickets to be the doctor that's there <laughs> when you wake up after a car accident. <laughs> it um, was very odd. Yeah. Um, but I wish uh, my parents were a little more uh, eye-opening for that. You know, I wish they would have taken the time or made some efforts with that. You know, personally, but you yeah. know, it's hindsight, right? They were they coming. They were going in a different direction. They wouldn't have. They probably exactly. wouldn't have seen it anyway from what their beliefs or whatnot. Again, not knocking their beliefs, but just saying. I agree. You're a Christian. You're not going to see Buddha when he's standing in front of you. Uh, mm-hmm. So, so you didn't get into the therapy till like two, three years ago. So, what what happened yeah. between being 13 and now in terms of? Did you try to make sense out of what happened? Did it just sit there in your memory? Did other things yeah. happen? Go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what happened was I just got angrier and angrier and grumpier and grumpier at the world. Um, mm. I wasn't connecting to anyone. I always felt different. You know, I just wasn't connecting. I, I felt I was thinking at a different level. I, I would say level at the time it was level. I think it's more of a frequency now than it is level because I don't think anyone's greater than anyone else anymore. But um, I just thought differently and I never really fit in. I tried to fit in very hard in college and high school and everything. I was good on my own, but I just never connected. And uh, what happened was I was making all close to six figures at a job, but my nickname was the grumpy troll under the bridge. <laughs> you know, that was my nickname at work. People wouldn't associate with me. They wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't socialize with me because I was like, mark, 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 you know, just a big grumpy guy. And uh, to me, I was German. So it was like I was making money. I guess it's working. Keep that going. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, then the money changed. <laughs> then the uh, the job changed changed and the money the job went away and the money changed and i was making less than half of what i was making there yet i was still angry and grumpy and miserable and i didn't understand why and it was at that point that i really saw there's something that i need to address because i can't go through life like this right and that's when i saw a neurolinguistic programmer a friend of mine had referred me to him and uh yeah, it's so, interesting. So you're you're seeing an NLP therapist quotes. Um, can you, in a in a nutshell, kind of explain what exactly neuro linguistic programming is, just so people can understand? Yes. Yeah. So um, what they generally do is they they use some hypnosis uh, techniques and they just speak with you about your history, and they try to go back into your subconscious to find the blocks that are keeping you from really realizing your potential or keeping you from being happy or content or whatever that, that, you know, whatever it is you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember, I remember walking into his office and this is where it really opened up for me. It really was an epiphany is I walked into his office and I looked around his room and just watching me scan the room, he cocked his head at me and he said, you're different. And, uh, that's when the waterworks started, you know. <laughs> I knew, I just felt, I always was, right? Um, and that's really how I connected with this gentleman. So, this, so everything, just like you really hit a button when he said that to you. He just, it resonated 100%. Absolutely. And, yeah. uh, and we did some work. So so what, what came next for me? I, I noticed you, you went to... Uh, you went into sensitivity training about a year later. You did some other stuff. I'm wondering, what was the? Were you trying to connect the dots? What was making you lead from one thing to the other? Yeah. So what it is, it's almost like this journey has slowly unfolded more by me opening my eyes, not really looking for it, but just being aware. Um, I did my first uh, hypnosis session with him with the NLP uh, therapist, and I had a vision, and I saw. At the time, I said it was Obama, but it was a black man behind a podium with a suit. And it turns out, in hindsight, that I saw, I believe in my mind, my heart, that I saw the shooting in South Carolina the Wednesday before it happened, or the Thursday before it happened. It happened on a Wednesday night. Um, it, during the meditation, I had this vision. I saw a man looking to his right and then turning to shake someone's hand to his left and a gun and a and a flash of a gun go off and i remember coming out of that meditation saying i just saw obama get shot i don't understand what it means and i was pretty pretty moved by that but it didn't it it went away pretty quickly but then i had a i had another session the next thursday and the shooting happened wednesday night and then i start and that's when he told me that that's what i saw 
He being and uh, I, I, the therapist. Okay, go ahead. Uh, he goes. You know, it's an odd thing what you mentioned. I saw this man. They just, you know, this man was shot. This is, I think, this is what you saw. So then I went back into an April 2015 footage of Clement to Pinckney, who was the pastor, mm-hmm. and he was the one. He was the one who was shot at the, you know, he was one of the nine, I believe it was nine people shot. And there's a state Senate speech of him making this very odd gesture. And it's exactly what I described. And when I saw that video, because I, I, once again, I'm a how and wire. I want to figure out what, what I saw. I, I saw that video and it shook me. I knew that something was going on. And that really started me to, to follow that. So you almost you had a kind of a precognitive vision of of the shooting in uh, Dylan. What's his name? Dylan Roof. Did yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, yes, yeah, Dylan. Roof, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's profound and intense, and yet there's some part of you, obviously, that that wants to know what to do with this. I mean, yes, it, it's absolutely. one thing to like you know, great, show me this a week before, but what what good did that do? So, and right. I think that is part of the right. problem sometimes with 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 psychic abilities is you get. Some people get intuitive flashes of things that happen, and they're like, "Well, what was? Why was I told this? What was? What's the point of this?" So I understand right. that it's a context, terrible. right? There's no way to stop it. There's no, I don't know these people. What's going on, right? I mean, that's that's part of it for me. Yeah. Uh, the other part, though, is what that really what that opened up for me was to look in my history. Why, why didn't I want to go to the baseball game? Why did I know I wasn't coming? You know, I started going through little points in my life and my history, going, I actually knew some things that I knew. I just wasn't aware that I I knew them, I guess, you know. So that really opened up the door for me to follow more meditation and, and things like that. Well, yeah, it's, it's part of the problem with, uh, you know, when you're first beginning to real, you know, we've been talked out of it from childhood. We've been taught to ignore our intuition. And then what happens is, uh, you know, it's the same thing with me. I had like, oh, I, I had a feeling that was going to happen, and it did. And I had a feeling that was, and And then what you have to start doing is you have to listen to the feeling. So I right. have a sudden reason, like, I'm going to walk this way instead on my way home. And it yeah. may be if I'd gone the other way, I got mugged, but I will never know that because I had to listen. Right. Because once you listen to your intuition, then you yes. don't always have the answers. Like, oh, great, you know, it told me not to go down Smith Street. I went down Jones Street and I got mugged. So see, that's, I was right. But who wants to be that kind of right? You know, it's like exactly. I predicted where exactly. I was going to get mugged. So uh, <laughs> that's always the problem of learning Learning to, for anybody trying to work through with this stuff, is one, learn to listen to your intuition. Because sometimes you have to separate a little bit from your fantasies because they can feel similar at first. You know, like I may feel depressed exactly. and want to, want to go home and eat a gallon of ice cream. And I'm like, well, that's not my intuition. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. And, well, and how many times have you talked yourself out of a decision? Yes. I mean, literally, cognitively talked yourself out of a decision, and it just went very wrong. Yes. And absolutely. you just, how many times do you look back and say, gosh, if I just listened to my gut, or if I just, and, and but know, that's the just art. paid attention to something. Learning, learning the difference. Learning what is my fantasy, what is my intuition, and then going with it and accepting. This is the hard part for for people, science based and rational based. Is that then accepting that you may never know why you were told to do something different. Like if you exact, if you'd taken the train, you never would have had that car accident. You know. Yeah, but you never would have known. I know it wouldn't have, it would not have been. <laughs> but you wouldn't even have known you didn't have a car accident. So you'd be like, I don't know why I didn't want to take the train. I wanted to take the train that day. So it's it becomes a conundrum exactly. for anybody studying this kind of stuff. Is it's in direct opposition to almost everything we've been taught? You should be able to measure things. You it, should. It be is not cognitive. No, yeah. nothing. Whatsoever. It's not measurable. It's not quantifiable. It's just is. Yeah, and and, and you just have to pay attention to it. Yeah. So uh, we're going to take uh, Mark further along his uh, journey, but first we have to take you through some commercials. And welcome back to Cosmic Tuesdays. It is Monday, October 2nd, 2017. My name is Anthony Pico. I am your host, as I always am, and we are on the air every Monday evening from 9.30 to 11 p.m. on the Hey Z Radio Network, which is where you are now. Mark? I am, sir. Oh, good. Okay. That's a good sign. Uh, I'm, I'm, as I've mentioned to many people... I'm, you didn't cut me out after the first segment, I guess. No, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm always... I'm doing everything here. I'm the music, musical coordinator and the, the technician and the interviewer, so I, I often 
uh, have problems, but not yet. Um, by the way, I do want to mention, I don't know if you, I tried shooting you a message. Uh, uh, somebody says you're talking very quickly, so they were hoping that you would slow down just a little bit. Um, because Excellent. apparently, I guess they don't have East Coast ears. Uh, you talk like an East Coast. I will be very conscious of that. <laughs> yes, I've been told that. <laughs> I've been told the same thing. It's 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 a East Coast New York uh, whatever kind of a, a corridor thing. So uh, it is an East Coast thing. For yes, sure. yes. Um, I had a person who was going to do transcripts of the show, and she wanted to charge me extra because I spoke so fast. Uh, so <laughs> you you investigate. Uh, a number of things. You take a sensitivity uh, seminar with a, a a medical medium. You're doing chakra meditations. Uh, what what is sensitivity training? What made you move in that direction? Um, like, wh- why was that the next step? Yes. you decided to look into. What were you looking for? That's it's a great question. So, how this has kind of unfolded? Like I said, it's been a very um, kind of a structured growth for me because as something was open, I would investigate that then that would open the door to something else. So after my meditation and having a couple of precognitive visions, I started investigating meditating a little bit more and more. But um, one of the things that I really needed to address was my anger, my depression, my suicidal ideations, uh, why I felt heavy, tired at the end of every day. I didn't understand, even though I was getting better, I didn't understand some of that. And I didn't understand where that came from. And someone, I think it was during a meditation circle, someone mentioned the term empath. And empath was kind of new to me. I work in sales and customer service. So I'm familiar with being empathetic or sympathetic, you know, things like that. But the term empath was very new to me. So I went on a website Mm -hmm. and, you know, the Internet's full of truth, right? Obviously. Uh, so there was a, uh, it's out there. <laughs> there was a web. <laughs> it is out there. The truth is out there. Just like, uh, X files, right? Um, there was a website, something like the 30 traits of an empath or 30 traits of an empath. And, you know, for shits and grins, I looked through and I checked off like 27 of the boxes and it, they all resonated with me. Everything spoke to me other than like eating meat and hearing cows scream in my head. You know, there were a couple that didn't really resonate with me, but okay. pretty much 20, 25 to 27 of them really resonated with me. So I started delving into what is empath or what is being an empath. And this gentleman, Dr. Emil Faith. Uh, It's F-A-I-T-H-E, by the way. Uh, He's in Scottsdale, Arizona, and he ran a what's called a sensitivity seminar. And he wrote a book called You Are Sensitive. And I decided, why not? What's, you know, 45 bucks for an afternoon to just get some understanding, right? Well, that's when it really took off for me because he's a medical medium. So he will sit there and he will look you up and down and he will tell you, you know, thyroid, liver, you have a heart problem or a kidney, things like that. Very interesting. Just mm. I'm just interested by that in the first place. Sure. I'm, I love to, to check that out. So um, what's interesting, though, about this is you and I are both men, but generally in the spirit world, it's it's a smaller percentage for sure. Uh, partially culturally, right? And men aren't allowed to have feelings and be that way. So yeah, it's I was in a yeah. class of... I was in a class of seven people, and I was the only male there. Um, But once again, it was a sensitivity seminar, so all of us were a little emotional, you know, throughout the day because we're kind of unburdening, right? Well, I took the light rail to work every day, which is like a public transportation, and I would visibly get ill when people walked on and off the train. And I didn't understand that as well. I just fell off and I looked to my left and three homeless people got on board, you know, things like that. So I'm in the sensitivity training and he's, he did a medical medium reading for everyone there because there were only seven of us. Yeah. So I'm very, I'm a skeptic, right? So I look at Timber and how he says something and what he says. I was very observant of the information he gave and how he gave it to see if he was, you know, if I could debunk it, right? I'm a debunker. I love that. I it's one of my favorite words. Um, so the first four women went up and, you know, a lot of it was, oh, you have a you know liver issue. Oh, did you have a heart heart issue? And she's like, yes, I just got out of the hospital for, uh, you know, heart, you know, some kind of heart operation or whatever. Um, so then it was my turn. And it, and that's when it really changed for me. So he sits down and he puts his hands out and you put your hand in his. 
And I sit down in front of him, don't think anything of it. I'm type 2 diabetic. I'm going to expect him to tell me, oh, you're type, you know, you have blood sugar issues. Right. So I put my hands in his, I put my hands in his and he freaks out. I mean, he pulls back and is like gasps, like, ah. And I'm already sent. I'm already kind of emotional here, and I'm like, I just broke the doctor. What did I do? And he pulls back, takes a sip of water, and he goes, "Okay, you have a lot of energy." He kind of composes himself, puts his hands back out, and I put my hands in his, and he says uh, something I'll never forget. He says, "Your family's coming through. You're homesick, and they miss you." And I'm from Philadelphia, so naturally I went to, yeah, my my parents live 2,500 miles away, uh-huh. and I miss them, and my brother's got some challenges, and I, I worry about them all the time. And he looks me dead in the eye, and he shakes his head no, and he says, no, it's your celestial family. He goes, oh, I, I don't get to, yeah, it, it threw me, trust me. <laughs> he says, uh, I don't get to tell many people this, but you're not from here. You're from Sirius. Okay. And he grabs my hands and he starts shaking them excitedly. He goes, it's okay, man. And I am too or something. He says something like that. And I'm like, I absolutely blown away. I mean, now, now star seed comes into it. Right. So I go from just a little precognitive vision and a meditation to meditating to sensitivity. Now, now I'm a star seed all of a sudden. Right. And it's just, just this natural unfolding of my journey. And it was extremely eye opening. Okay, um, you're still there, right? Just making sure. Yes. Oh, okay. I am. Yeah, I figured. So, you know, it's probably what, good that you talk a little bit. <laughs> no, no problem. I'm just sometimes when it gets quiet, I think I've disconnected myself from the air again. Uh, anyway, uh, so what does that what does that mean to you? I mean, I know it's it's a very hard thing to put into words. I've heard other people, yeah. uh, spiritual people, tell me that they believe that their energies from oh I don't know the Pleiades or other star areas. And do you have yeah. any inkling yet what that means when when he says, "Oh, you're from Sirius, so am I." You know, is that an I do. Okay, can you possibly try yeah. to put it into words? I that, think I can because I, once again, I don't come from this. It's not just right. something I jump on board. I, I, you know, I delve very deeply into information because, regardless of whether it's truth or fact, it's all information. Just when you open the show, you said the same thing. Right. You're going to take some of it that's going to resonate with you, some it won't. When he told me, I knew. It it was a knowing. I just knew that I was not from here. And I always saw, you know, I, my processor works differently. I just see the world differently. Um, not better, just differently. So, Starsea was very big because I started looking into what that means. And I started going to other meditations, and there are meetup groups that have star seeds and empaths and rainbows right. and indigos, crystals, and all this stuff. So, what's interesting to me is this: is uh, the next big meditation that I did after being told that. That's what was interesting for me. Um, I closed my eyes, and there's about ten of us in a circle, and uh, it felt like I, I was being transported somewhere. Uh, like I was flying through space in my meditation. Now, we were doing one of the chakra balances, you know, where you go through your different chakras, Roy G. Biv, you know, from the bottom, from the root up. Um, but all I saw was purple, dark purple. Okay. And all of a sudden, boom, I'm in front of this glowing orb of blue. And it looks like blue embers. It wasn't bright. It just was like a glowing hue. And it looked like a planet or a, a star system or something or star. And I heard in my ear, I heard home. And coming out of that meditation, I came out too quickly. I started hyperventilating. I almost passed out, actually. And I never looked up serious or anything of the sort at all. So then I went on- online that night and I looked up what Sirius looks like uh, from the Hubble telescope. And wouldn't wouldn't you know it? Boom. It is exactly what I saw. Okay. Um, and that really just kind of furthered my my pursuit of that. Well, yeah, it's not like you knew necessarily beforehand. So it's like, well, where'd that come from, right? You know? Exactly. And that's really what it was. I, I've i never chased something. I've never tried to force, force anything to fit. I'm kind of of the force nothing, fight nothing phase right, right. now. So I don't force anything to fit into a box, but I also don't reject it just because I don't understand it yet. 
Yeah, it's it's because there's <laughs> there's going to be so much stuff. Uh, you never understand when you go into these fields. Um, <laughs> but that's again, that's normal. I think it's it's the issue of you know you, you can even scientifically divide. You've got the left brain and the right brain, and one one makes free associations, and one is very linear and logical. And I think a lot of spiritual intuitive stuff comes from that free association. You know, you ask a you ask a painter or a songwriter, How, where'd you come up with that song? It's like, I don't know, I just, it was there, you know, <laughs> or I pulled that out of the that? air or whatever yeah, it was. was. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of didn't, stuff. Didn't somebody say that the statue was always there? I just had to remove the stuff around yeah, it? Yeah, I, I don't remember who said it. Sculptor yeah. said that? Some sculptor said it. You just have to remove everything that doesn't look like what you're looking at. Um, exactly. Absolutely. So, so you've kind of... Well, em- okay, you use the term empath, and uh, I'm just, I want to kind of clarify uh, what you mean by that word. You know, uh, for yes. the most part, an empath is very sensitive to other people's emotions. But uh, so the question becomes, and I'm not challenging you here, but I'm just asking, are you an empath? Are you just very sensitive? Uh, yes. You know, like if you're overly sensitive, other people can drive you kind of crazy because you'll you'll right. absorb. You know, one of the things I do as an astrologer, Pisces is a very empathetic sign. I always tell them, you know, Find a room where you can lock the door every day and be alone for a while. So uh, exactly. So one. That's what it is. So yeah, I, yeah. I can speak to the empath side. Um, sure, go right ahead. Once again, I didn't understand it. So once again, I, I would come home grumpy, tired. I, all the dreck that I felt, you know, the grumpy troll under the bridge. All this stuff was. I'm starting to understand it wasn't me. It was me absorbing everyone's negative energies that they're trying to get rid of. Everyone's trying trying to, you know, shrug off and just wash themselves of that. So they put that out there, and like a sponge, without understanding, I was, in my opinion, I was, I was unconsciously absorbing all of that information. And at the end of the day, I'd be tired, grumpy, angry. As soon as I realized what empath was, you know, taking on the emotions of others, not just feeling what they feel, but actually taking them on as your own. Um, that's when really started to understand and get better in a in an emotional way and my mood would change i wouldn't feel tired because i was aware of that happening so i could actually feel it coming you know versus just it happening to me okay so you began to pick it up before it got to you exactly i mean i would i would at least know where it came from or know that it was not me feeling that way you know, I I've always I was always a happy person, but I didn't understand why I was acting grumpy. You know, um, and once I realized that I, I was absorbing this information or this you know these energies, I was able to a protect myself, change my diet slightly, and do these things to help me protect myself from taking on everybody else's emotions. Well, you know, it's interesting. That somebody in the uh, chat room um, posted a little paragraph, which you may or may not. You know, respond to or not, but uh, somebody says what you are describing to a certain degree is sort of a hypoglycemic effect. He said that Dr. Atkins, in his first two books, forget his later books, spoke about how sugar uh, concentrated in hypoglycemia imitated many psychological diseases. And he says, by the way, the current A1C test does not record hypoglycemic crashes, so it seems hypoglycemia can be diagnosed as type two diabetic. And he goes on to say, I have to fight the doctors all the time about that. Uh, that is a problem with making medicines for a disease one does not have. So uh, I'm, I'm just passing that on. And that is actually true. Okay. Yeah, I can on. validate that, actually. Um, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've gotten to know Dr. Faith a little bit better as he told me that. I, not that I'm a groupie per se, but I do like following him or seeing when he does seminars and he's shared that exact information he goes you know your hypoglycemic it's all in your head this isn't what you're you actually are so what that paragraph almost reads very similar to to what uh what's going on with me okay so so there's there's some truth to what he's saying and you've been and you've been investigating i think so yeah okay um yeah a little bit yeah sure now uh well i have i have a couple of questions um do you think you were an empath before the accident, the, the one back when you were 13? I mean, I know you already obviously had some sort of a premonition about the accident, but that doesn't necessarily mean you were an empath. Um, so the question is, do you think the accident kind of triggered it for you, or you just think it was something you became more aware of, or, or what? That is an amazing question. I love that question, because the truth is, I don't know. 
um, I have studied this because uh, Daniel Teague, who uh, introduced the two of us, right? He uh, mentioned that he's a walk-in, and I looked into what a walk-in is. And Anthony, if you'd like to explain what a walk-in is, you probably can do it a little bit better than I can. But I can speak to my research on it. But yeah, I, and you I might can, know a little bit. I can too, up to a degree. Um, from what I understand, uh, sometimes people can have their this is such tough to use English language. Uh, are you going to use the word soul for the for short shorthand? Sometimes a person's soul may leave their body and somebody else takes over the body. They literally, uh, the term walk-in means that someone else has walked into your body. From what I understand, generally speaking, it's usually, uh, and this is, again, things I've read. I can't swear by any of it. Walk-ins tend to be more evolved beings that didn't want to go through childhood and didn't want to... <laughs> To go through all the crap and be the teenager, I guess, um, and so they want to come into a body, you know, adult, ready to go and to to do things differently. So there are some people that believe walk-ins are uh, like like you come in and, and use the body up to a point, and then you leave, and then the walk-in takes over the body and takes it the distance. Uh, often walk-ins can be associated with with the traumatic incidences, but I've also heard that walk-ins can be very uh, like. Before they're walked in upon, they're kind of like dull and boring and don't have a lot of friends. I'm not criticizing anybody. And uh, <laughs> uh, so they're almost like they're there, like holding the body for the walk in to come in. Um, yeah. I hope I, I hope can it speak makes to sense. that. Get 100%. Ahead. Yeah, go on, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I can totally attest that if I am a walk in, if I am one, right. it would not have wanted to go through the childhood I had. <laughs> I'll just tell you that right now. All right. Uh, so I can almost test that 100%. Um, but there's there's other different types, too. There's braided walk-ins where both souls exist, coexist or something. Um, it's something that I've actually really looked into when I had that out-of-body experience. Once again, this thing that happened you know, 20 or 30 years ago now, looking back at it, it potentially could have been a walk-in or a joint soul, like you mentioned, uh, experience for myself, and it really took off at that point. And maybe I just refused it, or, or refused to acknowledge it in the beginning, or you know, I'm not sure how, but that's that could very well be the case. So, uh, how do you cope? Like you're now aware that you're sensitive and empathetic. Empath- Empathetic. I wish I used a different word for that. Empathetic person. Um, does that, <laughs> I know. Does yeah, that change crazy. how you approach people when you're first meeting people? Are you uh, putting a spiritual wall up? Are you protecting yourself with an aura? Are you just putting a, a filter out there so you don't take on all the bullshit? What, what are you doing yeah. to uh, function better? So one of the biggest things uh, diet-wise is protein. I just I eat a lot of protein or just have a lot of whey protein because you kind of resonate at a higher frequency or just a higher vibration. So that was that that addressed a lot of my tired issues. Uh, the second one is just to be aware of your surroundings. Um, if I'm at a strange place, like if I'm on the light rail where, I, where there's a lot of public transportation, a lot of strangers, I will kind of just talk myself into protecting myself. You know, don't let other feelings come in. But the thing is, I actually don't mind the experience of feeling things. I, 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 I'm an experiencer, so I'm very open to people. So I almost, I almost, uh, probably to a fault, I probably accept it. I probably welcome it more than others. Uh, a lot of people can't deal with it. And now that I know what it is, I do know how to cope with it after the fact, but I don't mind taking it on initially because a lot of times I work now with people in pain. And when I can take someone's pain away and I know that I'm kind of siphoning off some of their pain and I see them react positively to that, that makes me feel purposeful. So I feel like I can have a purpose with that. Now, you talk about taking on people's pain. What I mean, what are you... What are the things you're doing with your ability that, I mean, do you do healing sessions? Do you, uh, where have you taken this that you would be in a situation where you would be taking on someone's pain? Just somebody walking down the street and you're saying, hey, take this burden (laughs) off yourself? Or is it something you do more in a more formal structure? That's all. Go ahead. I'll be honest with you. I'm I'm not at healing yet. I I, I think that's my next phase of, of my life. I am working in the healing arts, which we'll talk about later today. Sure. But, um, uh, 
I do, I can sense when people are just not right. So I don't mind sitting down next to a stranger and asking them, you know, they will tell me everything. I mean, I had a guy on a light rail sit down next to me. He goes, you know, I just got out of jail. <laughs> and I was sitting there like, what are you telling me this for? Uh, pleased to, meet, to, pleased you, to you know? meet you. Yeah, what were you? Yeah, I said, pleased to meet you. Thanks. <laughs> what you were know, you in jail uh, for? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I don't, I don't ask that question. I don't want to know that. But uh, a lot of times it's people in physical pain now because of the, the business that I'm kind of transitioning to. But it, I, I believe that there is a lot of energy work in my future. Um, I believe that that's part of my purpose is to bring us together, uh, help us understand each other better, and, and to really help heal the world uh, in that way, in a, in a spiritual, just, a, just an understanding or an energetic way. Well, um, once again, the chat room pops up and he says, ask him about grounding because he feels grounding practices, grounding practices eliminate most of that accepting other people's pain. Now, you say you're comfortable with it, but... Uh, do you that have is your, correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you so, feel, grounding grounding yeah. is where where you really kind of just... Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it the best in words, but you basically kind of go to the root of the earth and you, you kind of become like... Uh, just like a lightning bolt, right? Where if you're grounded, it kind of goes into the earth. It doesn't go... It kind of goes through you versus stick to you, I guess, is, is the best way to explain explain that um but but the truth is i i really love meeting people i okay. love their story i want to hear what they where they come from and i've always made a weird joke that i love i love meeting people but i, I hate knowing them <laughs> you know because it gets almost yeah. too much information you know so and, but i've always been fascinated with people as a whole no i can i can I can certainly understand that Um, because, look, as an astrologer, I'm certainly fascinated with people of all types because you you meet them all. And uh, uh, I look at charts and I'll be like, okay, I'll meet them and send you on your way because I don't want to live with you. But I understand what you're saying. Sometimes it's easier to to, to, to just be uh, briefly connecting to somebody in a sort of intense way and letting it, you know, go after that, which is anybody in any of these psychic slash mystical, whatever you want to call them, arts, uh, there is a need to find that balance because you want to reach out to people, but yeah. you have to make sure you have your own energy and you're taking care of yourself Correct. too. Uh, now, just, part of that, if I, if I may, um, part of that that's really interesting to me is, you know, everyone talks about God or source or creator. Now, I am a little bit broader minded. I call it the place from which everything came. Um, no one's ever fought a war over an argument over the place from which everything came, right? Right? Scientists will call it the Big Bang. Some will call it God, Source, Creator. Um, so to me, I think at the core of me, being who I am and believing what I am and who I am as a star seed, we're all connected. We're all from the place from which everything came. Right. So I always want to be connected to that in some way. And everyone has a puzzle piece. Everyone is a puzzle piece. And everyone will fit that entire picture once we're all connected. And I, I love the connection with people. That's what really drives me a lot. And what about animals? Um, just as a quick aside before we go to our next break, uh, do you pick up things from dogs or cats or animals too, or is it more great people, question? Uh, more people? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't have the animal thing. I don't have okay. the animal thing for some reason. Now I will say this though: I did. Uh, I did one of these swimming with dolphins where they had uh, one of the you know. You sit there and you shake their hands and do all this. Right. I looked into the eyes of that dolphin and I know I connected. Yeah, uh, dolphins are d- different. They're I think they're, they're actually smarter than us, <laughs> so, surprisingly. No, I, but uh, that I really connected with that. No, I'll, I'll look. I'll, we got to go to break, but I will say about 25 years ago, I went down and uh, swam with dolphins for about a week uh, in some workshops and stuff, and. Uh, yeah, you make that eye contact with a dolphin, and I went down there just thinking, oh, they're smart animals, and I came back thinking, oh, no, they just stayed in the ocean. They're, they're just as smart exactly. as, as we're doing. Uh, somebody named Stephanie in the chat room just says, hi, Mark, lovely show. Thanks for joining us, Stephanie. Maybe you've been there all along, I don't know. But we do have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, two to three minutes of commercials, and we'll be right back. And welcome back to Cosmic Tuesdays. Uh, one last third of the show left to go. Mark, you're there, right? Yeah. Mark, yes, Mark. I am, okay. sir. Wonderful. Uh, somewhere here I had questions I was jotting down. Um, 
when you you're okay so you've discovered you're an empath are you aware i mean obviously there's more than you know one empath per city so when you meet people can you immediately pick up if they're like oh wow you're an empath too or you're a lot more intense than other people who are again no judgment maybe more regular maybe have different skills in a different direction that is a great question and actually that's how i met daniel uh daniel teague uh who introduced us once again um he, he and I both went to an empath meeting, and there were about 30 people there. And whenever I go into a room, I kind of rub my fingertips together, and I kind of do like a radar. I put my hands out, almost like a radar dish, and I scan the room. And I kept going back to this gentleman that was sitting almost across from me. I don't know why. There were 30 people there, yet I was drawn to this one individual. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was Daniel. Daniel looks at me, maybe five minutes later, he nuts, and I knew right then there was something um what's interesting about he and i he and i have a very similar pa- uh, path he had a pretty severe traumatic car accident uh we're both pilots uh there's a lot of things that parallel us uh, in our in our lives it's very interesting how we connected but yeah i can't explain what it is but yes it is very palpable when i meet someone that's just sees the world differently or just feels the way they feel so you so you picked up on that right away so uh Absolutely. Does now being aware of being an empath, which is not the same as just being an empath, but becoming aware of it and realizing what's going on, uh, does that affect you in your business? Does it affect you when you're dating people? Do you find how do you how do you adapt to uh, sensing so much? I mean, you could be, I mean, you could be talking to somebody who likes to keep everything up tight and and private, but you're going to know what's going on feeling wise, even if you don't know the specifics. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it, I mean, one of the biggest things is a lie detector. So, working in sales, I have a very big bullshit detector. Um, okay, I am, I, I am kind of that person that will call people out because I know they're not speaking truth. And, and I'm not talking truth like you know your truth and my. We're talking what what they're really trying to mean. You know, when, when they say something, I don't. I know when they're not meaning what they say. And I pick up more on the inconsistencies of their of that than I do, you know, what they're telling me. It's how they're telling it to me and all the other senses. And I use that very often in my, you know, sales or just in general meeting people. It's actually very challenging. People do not tell you what they think. They feel and think things that they do not tell you at all. And I all I pick up is what they feel and think. And they're telling me something else. It's inconsistent and I it never resonates right with me. It just smells wrong or smells false. Well, my, my feeling has always been, and, and different people have different ways of, of uh, doing this, but if you're good at reading body language, uh, you have another BS detector. You know, you may do it yeah. through empathy, but I know that people, my wife is very good at this. She can just read the way a person speaks and the way they're standing and the way they're acting, and she can, mm-hmm. she just immediately knows who's bullshitting and who's not. So, yeah, it's exactly. there. I mean, that's the ultimate joke, and everybody tries to keep everything hidden. It's like if people are genuinely paying attention, whether psychic or spiritual or like a detective or whatever, you're not hiding anything, you know. So it's, no, it's kind you're of just a, not. We're kind of a joke in some ways. And good. And it is funny how my how the empath ability. I actually was naturally drawn to poker because of the strategy of it. But what I'm actually finding is I, it's more that stuff behind it, right? You you put out a bet, or you show your cards, or you don't show your cards. Those are the types of things. That that's how I was drawn to that. And there's days when I know I'm feeling dead on. I can walk into a place and just know everything. And then there's days when I feel off. And I never never used to go play poker when I was feeling off. I would only go when it felt right. Well, that was smart. And it was usually very successful. Yeah, <laughs> definitely smart. No, it's perfectly normal having an off day. Uh, it's, I don't care whether you're you know an NBA star or, or whatever. We all... I don't care how spiritual you are. You, you have off days, so it's not an unusual Absolutely. thing. Now, do you, when you get into a relationship, or if you've been in a relationship, do you, does that person? I don't like this word exactly, but does that person need to be an empath or sensitive? I mean, do, is it a problem if you're with somebody that doesn't have the same ability? That's a great question. Um, I'll share a little bit about my history. Uh, I just recently ended a six-year relationship with a woman who's a very, very good friend of mine. We are still very good friends, and I'll always love her, and I love her family, and we get along. Um, but we kind of grew apart over the last couple of years, and 
it kind of started a little bit when I when I started looking for what's quote unquote wrong with me, right? Um, she doesn't tend to have those types of abilities, and I found that challenging for me. And as we grew apart, we finally kind of both looked at each other and said, "This isn't working in relationship wise." So I believe that I am seeking someone who at least I don't know if it's has the same ability, but has an understanding of it or. Um, an empathy towards it, I guess. An empathy towards empaths, I guess, is what I'm looking for. But it uh, doesn't necessarily be, have to be the same ability, but a lot of it is, for me, is solitude. Um, spending t- time with everyone all the time, that's extremely challenging. So I do know that some more solitude is in my future. You know? Yeah. I think that's normal. I mean, as I said, even when I'm talking to the more empathetic signs of the zodiac, it's always you've got to find a way to you know, uh, put a a wall up for a while to like be alone with yourself because sometimes when I talk to Pisces, I'll say sometimes you feel everybody else's feelings and your own feelings get lost in that morass right. of, of feelings, and you've got to really kind of stay focused when you're when you're empathetic like that. Um, yeah. And I'll I'll be honest, we were definitely tuned in. I mean, there are times where I was sitting with my ex girlfriend, and I would sit there and go, you know, I could really go for a bowl of cereal right now, and just out of the blue, and she goes, I was just going to get up and get some. You know, yeah. those types of things were happening all the time. I remember our, our first date we went on, you know, we had talked about, oh, if you're going to have kids, what you'd name them. I actually knew the name of her, of her, what she'd name her child if she were to have a child. It was very odd when I look back at it now, you know, six years later. Wow, I had these, these I had these weird abilities. I didn't, you know, they were quote unquote coincidental or funny, you know, well, yeah. but they really weren't. They were, they were always there. Now, um, just a couple of quick questions. Do you, when you meet somebody, do you can you tell right away if they're actually diseased in some way? And I mean, like they have an underlying condition that maybe is defining who they are for some reason. Do you pick that up right away, or is it just an unease you feel? What is it you you pick up? It's a general. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would say I don't sense specific disease. Like I can't smell cancer like you know how you have there's certain service dogs that can tell right. when someone's gonna have an epileptic seizure right. or like there's like a cancer cat at the ward you know right be- right before people pass or something i don't have that but generally it is an uneasiness but a lot of people fight that so what i get more of is a discord of who they're how they're acting and how, what i'm feeling you know so usually i'll know it that way but i but i don't get specific like medical conditions okay make it makes sense so uh is, do you, would you consider being an empath a type of psychic ability? Or would you say it's a, a psychic gift, or it's just it's a different kind of a skill? Well, there are only multiple different types of empaths. Yeah. So, once again, going on the internet, if you just type in types of empaths, one of mine is precognitive, so it is a psychic ability. But by, by any means, I have seen futuristic things happen. I will literally say things under my breath, and next thing you know, they happen, and you're sitting there. It's so unconscious sometimes. Uh, it's more and more because I'm more open to it, but it started off like that. You know, like I said, Oh, I'm, I, I feel like I'm having a bowl of cereal. It's like, where did that come from? Right. I can't explain it, but, or I saw a futuristic event or something makes me uneasy, you know, turn left instead of right. There's something going on. Just like you mentioned about, you know, taking a different path home. Well, uh, once again, our gentleman in the chat room says, does he see the root causes of other people's problems? And if you do, do you tell them or not tell them? So I guess by root causes, he's talking about not the fact that, you know, somebody's in a bad mood today, but, like, what's the core of what's going on? Do you pick up on the root causes of other people's anguish? I, I do. I think I do. Um, and I'm, I'm a little sensitive to it, or at least to them, unless I know them better. Um, I'll, you know, for example, say I'm on a first date or something, and obviously this is a long time ago, but, um, <laughs> you know, you start meeting someone and you know something's up. But you don't. You're not going to share that with them right away. You can't just walk in and go, "Hi, by the way, um, I know everything <laughs> about you," and yeah, this isn't going to work or something like that. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times, I'll meet people and I'll continue a friendship. And if there's a, the right time for it, I go, "Hey, could I share something with you? You know, I, you know, let me pull you aside for a second and have that kind of hard talk. Is everything okay? Are you this? Are you that? Something like that. Um, but meeting people in general, I can tell. You know who radiates and who drains, if that makes sense. Oh, um, perfectly. I understand Ed, what you're talking about. Ed Sheeran is a. I'm a huge music fan. Ed Sheeran. I'm a big fan. He wrote a song called "Save Myself," 
and it's on his new album. And uh, he says, I gave you all my energy and I took away your pain because human beings are destined to radiate or drain. And now that I've got this awareness about it, I'm looking for people who radiate. And now that I'm looking for that, I'm finding that, which is amazing. I used to not look for that. No, but that's that's a great way to put it. I mean, I don't think everybody is all one way or the other, but certainly at different points in people's lives, uh, radiating or draining is, is definitely a direction we, we can go and, and, and deal with. Um, I think we all go through those periods, yes. for sure. Now, we're, we have about 15 minutes left. I'm not rushing or anything, but I do want to mention, um, sure. you've started up a website that isn't quite, it's called Knocked conscious instead of knocked unconscious.com which is actually will bring you to a his facebook page and uh, that you'll be working on uh, over the next weeks and months to make uh, to add stuff to um absolutely and uh you have let's see oh okay i'm looking through my notes here you're actually talking about that whole serious thing your your, your people were from serious um you had a past life regression from what i understand yeah uh and both of your lives were, uh, for want of a better term, alien lives or non-human lives. Is that how would? Yeah, they were definitely not on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> so, real quick about the not conscious piece. Um, one of my thoughts was uh, this may be a transition to podcasting for myself. I I believe one of my purposes is kind of the Professor X of the spirit world. Mm-hmm. I don't have his abilities, but I believe it's my job to find us and bring us together. So I, that's where I'm hoping this not conscious. That's kind of the direction I want to take with that. But um, that may that may be down the road a little bit. But I hope to do that. Um, yeah, with my past life regression is very interesting. Um, first of all, the two lives lives were not they were otherworldly for sure. Uh, the first one I went to, I was a purple mist, and I was actually being pulled away from another purple mist. I was a non corporeal being, and I remember coming here, being pulled here, and. Uh, tears started coming out the side of my eyes. You know, I was lying on my back and she's like, do you, you want to come here? And I said, no. And she's like, why are you coming? And I said, they're making me, you know, it's a very chilling thing to be voluntold to come here. Cause this is a hard, hard place to live. I'll be honest. It's, it's not an easy place. Sometimes, uh, the other one, I was actually a, uh, I was a Zeta or like a little three foot alien, you know, androgynous, uh, born in a test tube. And I was in charge of propulsion of my ship, and it either went supernova or, or was caught in a meteor shower. Okay. Uh, you know, was, I was observing scientific things. I can't explain that that's what it was, but what was really interesting about the reading itself or the past life regression was I recorded it. And right up until the point where I went into my past life, they kind of walk you back. You know, they're counting down from five. You're walking right. through a garden. You walk down these stairs. Well, at a minute and 40 of my recording – She's uh, the person who who walked me through the past life says, you are there. And the second that happened, the recording went wonky. It started going staticky and started going crazy. And I get chills every time I hear it. So there was something drawn in when I opened that door. And I can't explain what that was. It's it's not the first time I've heard of uh, recordings not recording and getting crazy during either psychic readings or... Uh, past life regressions or actually I knew one psychic who uh, who took the entire radio station off the air when she started answering questions so I think there is some sort <laughs> of that. yeah I'm sure there's some sort of electronic or electrical energy I mean energy is energy and if it's being evoked by uh, you know psychic abilities it certainly can or, or any psychic experience it certainly can disrupt uh, things like like past life readings um Sure. Now, we're getting 10 minutes left, and I know I want to preface, uh, and he's, uh, blah, blah. Mark will be back on October 30th for another show, but it's going to be a completely uh, different um, theme, because actually Mark has been involved, he's investigating and in, in marketing, I believe, CBD oil, am I correct in that? Could you care to the, elaborate what, what led you to that and what, what, what the potential yeah. is of that stuff, yeah. I'd love to share that story because that's the one that really drives my purpose now. Um, what happened was my ex, my ex-girlfriend's father was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and it had metastasized. And I have a medical marijuana card in the state of Arizona and I was looking for alternative treatments for him. So we went to seminars to try to get him some treatments for, you know, help with nausea from chemo and th- things like that. So I was studying this for about a year and, um, 
I get a call out of the blue in February of this year, and it's my godmother's sister-in-law. She lives out here. I go to Christmas at their house. You know, they're family friends. She calls me up. She says, Mark, you have a medical marijuana card. He goes, what do you know about CBD? And I said, it's really interesting. Uh, I've been studying that to help my ex's father with his with his cancer treatments and whatnot. She invited me to this seminar, or not seminar, but one of these meetings. And, you know, the people are doing their song and dance, how great they feel and all that. And that didn't resonate with me because I'm an empath, but the actual information was very accurate. So I signed up. But what was really interesting is um, it's a woman named Crystal Vermeer. She's a psychic medium. And she did a reading for me last November. And I was going home to take care of some very personal stuff. And she did a reading for me before I left. And not only did she have the information accurate, she had it in the order in which it happened. And I recorded her reading, and then I documented my vacation or my trip home, and it was unbelievable. There were about 10 points that were dead on with names, dates, places, things like that, that were not self-fulfilling. You know, you hear self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You're looking for a Mary. So you start looking for Marys. That's not how it was. It was all organic, and she did this amazing reading. Well, what's interesting is about two weeks after I signed up with this company to do CBD oil, uh, I get a call from Crystal, and she she says, hey, Mark, uh, uh, you have a medical marijuana card, right? And I said, yeah. She said, what do you know about CBD oil? I wrote this message for me back in December that, that I need to take CBD oil hmm. and that it's part of a multi – it's part of Amway and that it's a crap ton of money and all this stuff. And what's really interesting is not that she had the message. is that she waited until two weeks after I signed up. To ask me about it, because if she had asked me when she wrote the message, would have never been there. Um, And Crystal's actually on our team uh, with the CBD oil. She just won a cruise, actually. and She's doing very well. She's uh, making $2,500 a month right now with it. So um, it's really interesting. But what's funny how she just called me out of the blue two weeks after I signed up. I mean, once again, synchronicity, right? I am finding that this is my purpose now. Um, I'm not at the energy healing stage yet. I'm still learning about myself, but in the meantime, I'm trying to be more holistic and, and be more into health and wellness. And I do want to mention listeners, um, we're going to go in great depth about CBD oil, uh, on October 30th, but I wanted to give a little coming attraction. Um, there's more that could be covered in the next four or five minutes. So I just want to mention it's going to be an interesting second part to the show in an area of direction that, uh, I'm completely ignorant in. So I expect to learn. A lot from you. Uh, just a Excellent. couple of other questions. Somebody asked, do you meditate? And if so, do you meditate regularly? Somebody in the chat room asked that. Great question. Um, yes, I do meditate. When I meditate alone, I get nothing. It is the weirdest thing. I can't explain it. I, I may get a sense of calm or something, but it's all dark. However, when I meditate in a group, that's when I start seeing colors, I get a lot of purple is usually my big color, dark, you know, indigo, whatever, violet, that purple color. And I get a lot of green. Um, those are the two colors that I see more every once in a while. I'll get a little gold here and there, but I'm once again, I'm looking, I'm trying to find my purpose. And I think it is the collective purpose. I am here to be with us. And my journey alone is very bland, very blase. But when I'm with a group of people that are like-minded, I really bathe in that energy. I really feel that. And that's where I really like meditating. It's group meditations versus individually. No, that's, that's understandable. And I actually, uh, well, one, I understand your empathy is certainly going to help uh, uh, stir the, the combined energies. But I do too find it uh, group, group meditations are actually... Uh, more productive for me than than uh, solo meditations, so I understand I understand where you're coming from, what you're actually talking about. It makes uh, it makes perfect sense. Um, the other question, where the heck I gotta go through my notes? Um, what about your own emotions? Do you find now that you become uh, empathetic, let's say uh, that that are your emotions stronger? Do you have the same level of love and, and fear that you once had? Or do you find that when you feel them, they're stronger or, or what? I don't know. Tell me. <laughs> well, we all have fears and a lot of fears based on our cultural upbringing, things like that, our trauma and our history and things like that. But what I'm really finding is I feel pure joy and love 
at the at the deepest root when i sit down and i don't have to worry about events that happen and atrocious acts around i just love and i just feel joy and that's something i never could have ever thought i would experience but that feeling of love for everything is is a really powerful feeling yes yes it it when I get when I hit it, and I always hit it always. It's a very profound um, kind of a feeling. Absolutely, it moves me physically. I mean, I moved. I, I well up a lot. I, I mean, I'm probably more emotional now, or I show more physical attributes of my emotion. I wear my heart on my sleeve, I guess, in a way. But um, that's the only way we're going to connect is to be vulnerable. You you can't connect with another person until you let down your walls. Even though it's hard for empaths to do that. Um, I've always found that I won't be able to truly connect with someone until they see that I'm vulnerable too. Well, yeah, I, I think there's that need to to be on an equal playing field, so to speak. And I know uh, the Seth material. In the Seth material, he points out that uh, you know, if if a man cannot embrace his quotes female side and vice versa, then you really can't be in love with the opposite, the so-called opposite sex. Because if you're and yourself, yeah, and yourself too. But obviously, that you can't if you can't love yourself, you're not in trouble with loving anybody else. Mm-hmm. But I think it's true, though. Is if you don't embrace your feminine side as a male, how can you possibly love somebody who is a manifestation of you know the female energies that are out there? So yeah, no, I, I completely Absolutely. agree. It's a definitely have to tune in uh, to it. I do want to mention uh, Mark will be back October thirtieth um, to discuss CBD oil in more depth. Um, I find it somewhat amusing that Amway is now selling marijuana oil, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not Amway. It is a multi-level marketing company. So okay, um, I'll I'll get into that on the thirtieth. Okay, but it, it is a funny story that I'd love to share. And uh, if you want to reach Mark, uh, you can try knocktounconscious dot com. He's also on Facebook as Mark P as in Peter U L L U L S Mark Pulse and. Uh, just as a mention to everybody that listens to the show, as many of you already know, uh, the music at the beginning and the end of the show is by Mike Freeman, Zona Vibe. And if you go to jazzvibe.com, J A Z Z V I B E dot com, you can uh, check out his samples of his music. He's got a number of CDs. If you like the music, it's great stuff and it's worth picking up. I also want to mention um, we've a number of times. We've mentioned the name Daniel Teague, T-E-A-G-U-E. He has been on the show a couple of times. He's also been on an earlier version of the show with me and when I used to have a co-host. Um, Daniel is an energy healer, and uh, you can find him on Facebook at Daniel Teague. And at the moment, you don't remember his URL address, do you? I do. It's uh, Vega, V-E-G-A, yes. star, S-T-A-R, healings with an S on the end. Vega, Vega star, star healings. healings. Okay, thank you. Daniel, yeah. uh, a word out to you. Uh, Daniel is always bringing me uh, interesting people to interview. Um, and Daniel himself is a fascinating energy healer because uh, he's coming from left field somewhere. And I say that with the highest <laughs> praise. Uh, I think he's... He's finding new ways to do energy healing and new ideas of what energy healing can, what shape it can take, and how different things can help different people. So he's worth checking out. It's worth listening to the old archives, which can be found at hazyradio.com backslash archives with the Cosmic Tuesdays uh, folder. This show will be in there, too, in a few weeks. Everybody, I'm very sorry. I'm behind on catching up on my archives, but that will be done very shortly. Uh, Mark, thank you a thousand times a thousand for coming in. Thank you. And chatting. Thank you very much. I feel blessed and grateful for the opportunity. And we'll have you back in a few weeks to talk about that oily stuff. And uh, we're going to end the show with Blue Jade from uh, Mike Freeman's Ono Vibe's latest album, also called Blue Jade. 